going back for the past five versions or so, is really building out an entire suite of tools that allow you as developers to deploy and build, manage, and secure applications for business um, using the phones and tablets that you can buy off the street. Um, and so that's what my talk is going to be about, about today, is really introduce a little bit about Android Enterprise and talk a little bit about Android as a business platform. We look at Android as really the most diverse computing platform in history. Um, I would challenge folks in the room to find another platform that can span, go, all the way from smartphones and tablets, which we traditionally think about as enterprise mobility, all the way to dedicated devices like those from Zebra Outback, barcode scanners, RFID readers, and the like, devices that are used in shared applications like healthcare, kiosk devices. If you've checked into a airplane, you know, an airline and gotten your boarding pass, there's a better than even chance that that could be an Android device. Embedded point of sale, lots of devices being used now for cat, things like cash registers, all the way out to digital displays, VR headsets, and even the Internet of Things. When you start to loop in Chromebooks into this equation, using Android runtime for Chrome, you now have really one code base inside of a business that can go from the smartphone in my pocket that keeps me productive while I'm on the road to the dedicated device I use to actually get my work done in more of a field service environment, all the way to the laptop on my desk that I use to crunch you know, numbers and presentations and things like Excel. So this is an incredibly broad platform that Google has built from a business enablement perspective. We really value that this should be one platform for you as developers. One platform and one code base to build against, one platform to manage, one device even that allows you to bring your work and your personal life together. One of the big things we focused on at Google with regard to Android has been this idea of bring your own device. And we don't think about that as you should bring your own phone and you know, save your company some money. We, what we really mean by that is you as an employee should be able to blend work and personal together, whether that device is owned by your organization or it's owned by yourself. The goal here is to allow you as the end user to be productive as well as ensure that the data is kept secure, particularly here in Europe where GDPR is a critically important task. Anybody not familiar with GDPR? A year ago, lots of hands would go up. The idea here that you have to keep data under your control and you have to build privacy by design, we build a lot of those tools directly into the Android platform. Uh, one of the lesser known stacks, uh, stats, if you will, statistics about Android is that it is in many ways the leading platform from a business use perspective inside enterprises. 380 million devices run Android in, are, are predicted to ship into businesses today that run Android. And what that means for you as developers is that this is an incredibly target-rich environment that you can go and build against. Um, throw a stone against the wall and there's a likelihood you will find an end user inside the world's leading organizations running an Android device today. From an enablement perspective, we think about the work we do at Google in a few core ways. One of the big investments we've made um, from Google is really taking Google Play and making it extensible for business uses. So for those of you that are building consumer applications, you're likely familiar with Play as a construct to publish the applications out to the billions of users around the world that use Android. But Play is also available for an organization to publish their own private apps. Any of you, any, how many folks here do enterprise development today? Cool, most of the people here. So you've all probably run into, gosh, I don't really want my app to be out there for the public. If you're a pharmaceutical company and you're using Android to gather trial data about some very, very cool drug that's gonna make you billions of dollars, you probably don't want that application being run and you know, downloaded willy-nilly from anywhere. But at the same time, we've traditionally looked to a way to do private channel distribution by enabling unknown sources which drastically um, increases the likelihood that that device is gonna run malware. 
So what we did with Play is allow you as the developer to use our infrastructure and use the trust model we've built with Play to publish applications directly to employees. We have all sorts of crash and performance data that we've built, uh, uh, tools built in the platform. And more importantly, there's security tool sets as well. So we commonly look using Google Play Protect uh, inside the applications you upload to Play to make sure that there's just general good hygiene, that you know, you're not using out-of-date SSL libraries or uh, you know, other just poor coding habits haven't been um, exhibited. So the lots of investments have gone there. Lots of investments on the Android front have also gone into management. From a manageability perspective, and this is for those of you that are on the enterprise IT side of the equation, Android is incredibly flexible. If your employees are bringing their own devices uh, into the workplace, you can manage Android devices using what's called a work profile. That's a, a user space on the device where all the corporate data goes into. You as enterprise IT have full control over that corporate data, but you don't see anything personal on that device. You don't see Spotify or photos or other random data the user may have, have brought with them. Um, but BYOD is not necessarily right for every, every deployment mechanism. In some cases, in financial services, as an example, you need full control over the device. So in that particular example, you can manage the entire device should you want to. You can use what's called a fully managed device, and you can decide whether or not to deploy a work profile on top of that. What that basically means is if you want this device to look like a BlackBerry, and only let corporate data on it, fine. We can see that can be supported by Android. If you want the end user to say, hey, it's the World Cup, and I want to go and watch the latest sports games while I'm supposed to be working, not that anybody in this room would ever do that, I can allow for that and still make sure that any corporate data that I've deployed on this device is still kept secure. And we've made a lot of investments, and we'll talk about this with regard to Android P, in what we call dedicated devices. These are for you folks that work at the power company or work for a shipping company that are using Android devices to go bloop and make sure that your package has been scanned or that your water bill is being read correctly. And so you can lock down the experience um, fairly dramatically on an Android device in ways that you can't necessarily on other platforms. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Just a few examples of, of cases we've seen Android be successful. Marks and Spencer, have anybody familiar with Marks and Spencer? See, this is what, doing this presentation in Europe is awesome because people go, yes, I've heard of that. You go to the US and people are like, what's a Marks and Spencer? Marks and Spencer is obviously one of the leading uh, retail brands in Europe and, and massive in the UK. There's a joke with the Marks and Spencer guys that there is one on every high street and having traveled through the UK recently, I can vouch that that is true. They've used Android to totally revamp the entire customer experience. They deploy Android devices to all their stock workers and they can now go through and do things like say, hey, you're, you're, you're a consumer and you ask is there milk? they can look up in real time and find if there's milk. But more importantly, they can look up you and they can say, did you know that you have rewards card statuses or rewards card points that haven't been consumed yet? Help me go and work with you to figure out how to go and, and, and consume some of those reward points. Or you like this pair of pants in black. I don't have those in black, but the store next door does. Or let me go and make sure they're on your doorstep tomorrow. Uh, through an online channel. And why is that important? Because now I've got the consumer who's at my doorstep locked in this customer experience and I'm engaging with them and I'm not giving them the opportunity to go to Amazon or go to another online channel uh, because they can't find what they need in store. We've worked closely with Pitney Bowes uh, who is revamping the postage scale, which may seem like a really boring topic, but the idea here is, is that tradition, if you look at a postage meter, and this is literally weighing mail, um, that has been a really analog process. I weigh the mail and then I go on my laptop and I print postage. They've gone through and built an entire digital postage scale which goes out and, and says, hey, UPS is going to be the cheapest way to go and, and, and ship this particular package. Let me go and print the postage for you. Traditionally, those types of embedded applications have been custom-built hardware on custom-built operating systems, maybe Windows CE or embedded Linux. But because of the work that folks at the Google management uh, 
side of the equation have done, you can now customize that entire experience over the air. So if you want an Android device to look like the seatback entertainment in an airline and have it make it look very much like custom hardware, that's supported as well. And finally, Australia Post has rolled out a, a, a thousand devices and they're growing as we speak uh, to do all the logistics and postage uh, handling for the uh, country of Australia uh, using Android devices as well. So there's a lot we've done on the manageability perspective. There's a lot we can do to make sure that devices are kept secure, that you can deploy applications out to your employees, that you can configure those applications at scale. And John Markov is going to walk through a lot of those best practices, no pressure, on how to go and use the Android platform and use tools from Google uh, for that management and deployment um, side of the equation. But I wanted to talk about a couple of other more forward-looking investments we're making, and then we'll talk about Android P. Anybody familiar with TensorFlow Lite? Lots of nods. So the fact is, is that uh, you know, we see in business a lot of folks looking toward machine learning as a way to unlock new value uh, in their mobile deployment. I, if you talk to a lot of enterprise customers, they go, yeah, mobile first. I did that. That was that Apple thing, right? And now they're looking to say, how do I use AI? How do I use big data? The fact is, is that my belief is that mobile is going to be the, one of the key interfaces to that data in the cloud, as well as one of the key ways to gather data in the field. But the problem is gathering every piece of data and sending it off the to the cloud for processing doesn't work necessarily because of either bandwidth concerns or latency concerns or just broader responsiveness for the application. And so recognizing that, last year we launched TensorFlow Lite, which takes the, entire, it takes the SDK platform of TensorFlow and makes it consumable on a mobile device. What's lesser known is the work we did actually on Android to accelerate that work, because TensorFlow is available not just on, on Android, but other mobile platforms as well. And so as a part of Android 8.1, we launched what's called the Android Neural Networks API. What that allows you to do as developers is not necessarily have to know about the various levels of hardware acceleration that are available through you know, various hardware vendors. You can just build your apps and tools like TensorFlow. We're working also on support for CAFE, too. Um, but you can use Android as a really, really powerful way to drive business workflows and have machine learning. So things like image recognition, barcode scanning, uh, optical character recognition happen very quickly and performantly on the mobile device. So when you start to look at this from a measurement perspective, like does this stuff actually work? We've done work, uh, if you, you, one of the ways to measure um, performance of uh, machine learning libraries is to put them through common tasks. So one common task is the um, Envision 3 uh, tool set, which basically looks at object characterization with photos. Like, is this a dishwasher or a zebra? One of these two things you probably want in your home, the other one you don't. So it runs through a thousand different classifications. And when you look at a, a device like a Huawei P20 out front, uh, which has the Kirin 970 chip and all these AI enhancements, the fact of the matter is we saw a 10x performance increase in terms of lo lowered latency compared to doing those exact same executions uh, directly on the CPU. Now, this year at I.O., we launched MLKit. TensorFlow Lite's incredibly powerful if you're looking to do uh, your own machine learning models and execute those on the mobile device. But not all of you want to train your own machine learning model. In fact, I see a lot of people going, no, I really don't want to do that. So MLKit takes uh, machine learning and brings it to Firebase. It allows you to take pre-trained models in the areas of things like uh, optical character recognition, barcode scamming, image classification, and more. Um, and again, either through web services APIs or through on-device APIs, uh, execute those in a very simple way. So you can go through and get come from zero to machine learning in way less steps. So that's sort of a high-level overview of, of, of why we're seeing Android be successful in business. It's incredibly flexible to deploy against. It's incredibly flexible from a use case perspective. It has spans a whole variety of price points and form factors that other mobile platforms in the world can't possibly match. Um, and, and frankly, there's a wealth of tools for developers to make sure that the right apps are in the right hands of their employees. 
So the next question, and I'm sure you're asking, because I ch titled this as what's next for Android Enterprise, not why should you use it. The question is, well, what's coming in the platform? What if we look down, you know, six to 12 months, should I be thinking about? So one of the things we're, that we're making improvements on is in Google Play. Um, traditionally, if you look at Google Play, you've had to go through as a, either as a developer or as an IT admin and take your apps and put them in play. And there was sort of this disconnect between what you could do in your enterprise mobility management system and what you could do in Google Play. And we've worked very hard to bring those tool sets closer together. Um, one is through private app publishing. So you can now take applications directly from your EMM console and publish them into Google Play. And you as an organization could decide, do you want those application binaries to be distributed through Google Play itself? So on a global basis, your apps go, you know, you're downloading directly from Google's CDN and not through you know, an enterprise hosted file server, or you can do the exact opposite. And as the enterprise, you can host those application binaries uh, yourself. And so we've built tools to allow you as the EMM uh, to uh, handle the, that private application publishing directly from your console. One of the other areas, and this sort of harkens to the keynote conversation from earlier, is web app publishing. So we know that a lot of folks are using web tools as a way to build applications. And this is particularly true in cases where the application may not be um, customer facing. So I need just a really simple approvals app or a really simple app to go and gather data and throw it in either to an on-prem or to a cloud platform somewhere. Um, and full disclosure, there weren't really great ways in Android pr uh, prior to publish those web applications out to your employees. And so we've now built tools in Google Play to surface both native as well as web applications directly down to the end user. And finally, um, one of the areas we've also invested in is customization. So uh, directly in your EMM console, you can customize the layout of your application store, uh, you know, handle things like how objects are aligned or the categories you're publishing to your users, uh, things of that nature. That's what that looks like on the right-hand side. Uh, is anybody using device admin today, device administrator as an API, one person? Or other people just don't want to admit it because what I'm about to read on screen? Uh, what are you using it for as a use case? Sorry to put you on the spot. So for, for kiosk and for screen pinning and things like that? Got it. Um, please stop. <laughs> so, uh, not, and and sorry, sorry to call people out. Thank you for being a good sport. Um, device administrator as an API was really never built to be an enterprise class way of managing devices. Um, and so starting in Android P, we're going to deprecate the enterprise use cases of device admin. So things like um, uh, setting password complexity uh, or hardware lockdown, like turning off Bluetooth or turning off the camera. Uh, we really want people to use Android management tools as the way to do that. I'll talk about some ways we're making that even easier for developers and folks like Ian Marciani and others tomorrow will go into that in great technical depth. But realize that in Android P, we're going to go through and deprecate these tool sets. And in Android Q, they're going away entirely. So in Android P, we're telling you and we'll flag an exception. In Android Q, they just won't work. Um, so just as one of those things where we're trying to give you guys a couple of years a head start to uh, realize that this is coming, but this is a, a fundamental change uh, that we're making in the platform, and, and we really want you guys to kind of harmonize around the work we're doing around Android management and, and, and move away from device admin. So a couple of the, if I think about thematically around the investment areas we're making for Android P, uh, I, I sort of lump them in, in three main areas. One is around... Uh, better, more intuitive user experience for the work profile, that separation of work data and personal data, whether it's on a corporate-owned device or a personal device, uh, better enhanced tool sets for enabling those more dedicated device experiences that I talked about earlier. How do I enable things like kiosk uh, in a way that is, uh, is scalable and more customizable? And finally, uh, just general housekeeping around things like security, uh, profile hardening, and the like. One of the things I'm most excited about 
uh, is that, you know, and a big concern that I hear from enterprise customers is around updatability. Like, hey, if I get an Android device, is it gonna run another dessert upgrade like ever? And so we've been working pretty aggressively through Project Treble to make the upgrade process easier for OEMs. We've now also brought the silicon providers into the loop as well, and we're bringing them much more closely into the fold. So we're basically developing the Android platform alongside their development of the baseband. And the output of that work has meant that for the first time ever, OEMs other than Google now have the Android beta available. So if you're running devices from folks like Sony and from Nokia, uh, and from OnePlus, uh, you can now get the Android device, the beta available on those devices. Um, so I'm, I'm super excited, super, super excited about that. So let's talk a little bit about work profile. How many people are familiar with work profiles on an Android device? Few people. Cool. So for those of you that aren't, as I mentioned before, a work profile is really the way that you segment work data and personal data on an Android device. What that means is uh, you can deploy Google Sheets or you can deploy Gmail out to an end user and they actually get two user spaces, two almost versions of the same app on that device. So I get work Gmail and personal Gmail or work Microsoft Office, I don't know why you would use that, and personal Microsoft Office. But the point here is, is that a lot of these applications you know, share uh, personal and work data if I were to install them in the same user space. By breaking them out, basically there is a firewall, a big solid line that says work data, personal data, these things shall not meet. And that not only is from at an application level, that also is in uh, persistent storage. We actually encrypt the data with separate encryption keys. Um, in the work profile versus the personal profile. It also extends to the runtime. So I can actually turn work mode off. And what that means is when I go home at night and I turn work mode off, John, not to pick on you, can't go and ping me when I'm basically eating dinner or, uh, or, or trying to go to bed. And actually, John's on the East Coast, so usually it's the other way around. I'm, I'm reaching out to him. But the point here is, is that you can turn that work mode off. You can actually now uh, do that administratively. So if you're trying to align to things like the French right to disconnect law, which says you know, you're not supposed to work after five, um, you can actually go through and set that as a policy. And that means that those apps aren't even allowed to run. You don't get notifications. They don't consume consu CPU. It's an incredibly powerful way to handle work and personal data at the same time. The biggest challenge that folks had was, let's see if this works. This little orange badge is what said that was work. And so people would see downloads without a work badge, downloads with a work badge, down without a work badge, with a work badge. How do I know where to go to get my corporate data? And it was really confusing for a lot of folks. So in Android P, there we go. Uh, we've actually separated out the tabs so you can see personal and work uh, uh, really easily at a glance. So I very quick, as an end user, know exactly where to go. We've also made the little briefcase blue because that aligns better to material design and accessibility. And more importantly, that idea of turning work profile off, we've surfaced up directly in the UX. You've been able to, I believe, since NuGet, been able to swipe down and, and do it through the Quick Settings app. Uh, but now we've surfaced it directly in the launcher to make it easier to find. So lots of improvements to make it easy for you to find, uh, find data and, and keep data secure and segmented. Um, another area that, that has been incredibly powerful for Android has been this idea of kiosk mode. So you were able to go and lock the device down to a single application, and that was, you know, basically customized the experience so a field service worker can't go through and play solitaire while they're working, supposed to be scanning packages, or, or worse still, betting on the World Cup. So kiosk mode, you know, allowed you to build that custom experience. The challenge was that your applications had to know that they were in a kiosk and actually had to know how to multitask between one another. And so in Android P, one of the things we did was built a custom launcher that's built into the, into the OS. And that means now that any application without any development work can be put into kiosk mode. 
If you're a hotel as an example and you want to put a tablet in the hotel and build an app to, to control the room and an app to control the television and another app to order room service, you can build that customer experience and then using Google Play, let's assume you sign a deal with Condé Nast and you want to put all their magazines onto the home screen. You can do that over the air using Android's management tools. And the Condé Nast apps coming out of Google Play don't need to know that they're, that they're in a kiosk, they just work. Um, also, just better UI flexibility around customization. So uh, disabling things like the status bar, disabling things like signal strength indicators. If you want this to be you know, kind of a stripped down Android and, have, and for a field service app where you can see things like battery life, you can do that. If you want it to go and look like custom hardware and have no UX at all other than the apps on the screen and the apps that you build, you can do that as well. Just that level of flexibility is available. And what's cool is all of this is available over the air. Uh, shared devices has also been an area where we, we've seen a lot of requests, particularly in areas like retail uh, and healthcare. So how do I go through and... Um, that's not what I wanted to do. Uh, how do I go through and start my shift at the beginning of the day, log into an Android device, and then when I end my shift, make sure that my, G my email data is not persisting and that you know, somebody else can go and log into the uh, device uh, at, at the beginning of their next shift. So we introduced tools in Android P to do just that. You can basically go and log in, get the apps that you need to be productive, work on those apps, and then log out at the end of your shift, allowing that device to be reused by another employee uh, later on that next day. Uh, postponing updates is another one that uh, we, we hear about, particularly in retail. Uh, anybody here work on retail apps? Handful of folks. So I'm sure you've dealt with the please don't publish your app at Christmas. In fact, don't publish it in the entire month of November. Because the fact of the matter is, you as a retailer, the last thing you want is in the lead up to Christmas through the end of Boxing Day for your mobile apps to crash and all of a sudden you can't make money. So one of the things we've done for an enterprise setting, so apps that are, or devices that are being used inside of a business, is offered the ability to postpone over the air upgrades. That's both security patches as well as uh, uh, dessert upgrades up to 90 days. So if you're doing the lead up to the Christmas season, you would stop, let me make sure I can do the math right. You would stop updates in October. That would let last you through January. And then there's a 30-day cooling off period. So that means come January, 30 days must pass before you can go and, and postpone updates again. What that means from a practical perspective is those big block holiday items, the shopping, Christmas shopping season, the summer holiday season, uh, you can sort of freeze those Android devices in a point in time state to ensure that, you know, God forbid any over the air updates from uh, uh, from Google conflict with any applications that you've built. You can also use that uh, potentially to go and, and do additional software and integration testing for updates, or if, or if you said, hey, I think this security patch is breaking things, freeze the environment, regression test, and do your changes before keeping the, uh, starting the update cycle again. Um, I, I've talked a lot about the Android Management API. One of the things that we see or hear about from the market our concerns around, you know, hey, I only want to enable three applications on Zebra devices, and I want to make sure that uh, my, empl my employees aren't screwing around the mobile device, so I just want to do some lockdown stuff. Um, is there a way for me to do this directly in my app platform? Because myself as, I don't know, a really large retailer, I don't deal with that IT stuff that does email and device management. I want this all on my platform. Um, and so traditionally, that has meant going and building your own client management software that calls client-side APIs. And it was a relative, you basically it put you into building your own EMM. And that was really tricky. And so what we're doing right now is building what's called, or actually we recently released, uh, the Android Management API. It gives you one consistent, easy-to-use API uh, out in the cloud uh, that you can go and integrate to to manage Android devices that are out in the field. It includes 
feature-rich capabilities, so the device management agent exists directly in the operating system, and we're updating that work about every six weeks to go through and unlock new capabilities. So we started with things like dedicated devices. We're now including additional use cases for knowledge workers and lots more stuff in the pipeline. I'm not going to steal Ian's thunder, so he can go into that detail later. But the point here is that this is you know, the Android experience by Android for Android. Um, and we definitely, if you guys are getting calls from your customers to say, hey, is there a way for me to collapse a lot of this management and security stuff into an application platform, uh, be, looking, uh, be looking at this as a set of tools to use. So there's lots of cool stuff around Android P. If you think about Android P as a broader platform, we have lots of things around um, uh, you know, coming on the consumer side, but we've really looked at this as a release, as we have for the last five releases of Android, as a way to make the business experience better. And that's really what Android Enterprise is. It is those tools uh, on, on a phone platform perspective that make it easier for you as developers to publish and manage apps and the data on enterprise devices. But there's also an entire ecosystem that comes along with us. We work very closely with a whole host of folks to ensure that Android, not just as a platform, as a security and management platform, but also as a set of devices and a set of software from all of our partners, gives that best-in-class experience for customers. So what's new with the ecosystem? Well, one thing, again, as I mentioned, is we hear from customers concerns around um, if I get an Android device, is this going to be a business class device? I think from a platform perspective, we've been very, very aggressive about making all these application security and management tools accessible in the uh, platform. And so you can actually get an Android Go device at 50 euros unlocked in India, and it will technically be enrollable into an EMM. Now, would I think that an Android Go device is the right thing to choose if you're a big global bank like Deutsche Bank? Possibly not. Right? It's not going to necessarily give you, it's certainly not going to give you a work profile. There's not enough memory. But there will be maybe other things that aren't necessarily there as well. So we've recently launched the Android Enterprise Recommended Program. And this is a program where Google is going to the ecosystem and saying, of the 200 and something different hardware providers out there, which of you want to focus on the business to business market? Which of you want to focus on enterprise? And uh, a handful of them have gone and stepped up, and they're basically obligated to meet minimum criteria around consistency so that the enrollment experience from a Nokia to a Huawei device is the same no matter what device you choose. Uh, device selection, that these devices have a consistent set of hardware requirements, uh, as well as that they stay current with security updates. So they will get security updates at least every 90 days. Many OEMs are already doing better and, and actually deploying every 30 days, as well as they will get at least one dessert upgrade. So those of you that are consulting with companies and companies are saying, hey, do I choose this device or that device? You can look to that enterprise recommended badge up on android.com slash enterprise to help simplify that selection process. We have uh, 31 devices across nine OEMs and growing. We recently just certified our first tablet uh, with our friends at Huawei. There's lots more devices in the pipeline that are coming. Um, and we're looking at other uh, both uh, uh, form factors, uh, hardware uh, form factors, as well as even things like software, manageability, carriers, et cetera, uh, into this program as well. Uh, we're also taking a big focus on ISVs uh, and, and digital uh, platforms. So those of you that are in the kind of the consulting space, um, one of my roles at Google is I focus on a lot of these digital initiatives. At Sapphire two weeks ago, we uh, SAP announced that uh, they will have an entire SDK suite available, and I know Mike is going to talk about that later today, um, that allows you now to build native applications on, that are using SAP Cloud Platform on mobile devices. Traditionally, this was limited only to iOS. This is now available on SAP for Android as well. And we at Google have worked very closely around things like security reviews, best practices with, Google, uh, with SAP. And SAP has actually built these tool sets directly into Android Studio. So you can say, I want to connect to this set part of SAP Cloud Platform against these OData objects. And it will actually scaffold you not only all the, all the code to do the connections, but also base level UI that marries SAP's design language with material design. So lots of cool stuff like that as well. 
Uh, we're, working, we're looking to go and engage other consultancies, other application platform providers uh, to scale this part of the ecosystem uh, going into 2019. So uh, I think if I were to close on a couple notes, one, um, you know, Android is really a, an incredible platform if businesses are looking to uh, mobilize business processes uh, or even start out their digital transformation journey. Android's diversity really allows for any use case that your enterprise customer can come up with to be met in a really, really rich way. It has been already proven in large enterprises across the globe across every use case from knowledge workers working at desks to people working on power lines uh, and more. And the platform investments that we're making at Google are really enabling Android to be well aligned to any future innovation that folks here in the room can come up with. So I know I'm out of time. I'm going to pause here. Questions or are we going straight to the next session? I think we have time for one or two questions. But first, thank you, Sean. Of course. Thank you for this uh, insights you're giving us.